Welcome everybody to today's webinar of our series in cooperation with the Sector Network SNRD Africa on the topic of rural employment with a focus on youth. I just want to give you a brief overview why we commissioned the study. Our sector project is uh, quite new. We started last year in summer. And even so, um, employment promotion is not new to GIZ. The colleagues from the sustainable economic development sector do that since many years. But we saw that for our specific case, employment creation, especially for youth in rural areas where agriculture and agri-food systems play a vital role, is uh, not yeah, it's not so developed yet. There was no standing approach. There was not clear what works. So we knew from some projects, either from, from our personal experience or from hearing that they are working on the topic. They have a full project on this, as we saw the case in Sierra Leone. They have a component on this, for example, what we did in Tunisia. Or they have some small activities where they try to integrate the use and to increase employment options for them. So we saw to begin with and to know a bit better what is already going on and what works and also what doesn't work, which is also very important, uh, we commission a study and a look a bit deeper and a bit more systematic into what is already going on. So that was the very um, simple background of the study and I'm very glad that we found um, Endeavor to collaborate with us and to look more into the projects. And I would like to thank Endeavor already for the work they have done and also all the colleagues from the projects, either from the economic development projects or the rural development projects that we contacted and they found the time and collaborated to give insights on what they are doing and what is their experience on how to promote employment for the rural youth. So just to drop a couple of numbers on you, um, the um, number of youth in developing countries is expected to grow from today 1.2 billion to uh, 1.6 billion um, within the next 15 years. And um, as you can see on the uh, the right hand side of this, uh, uh, sorry, on, on the left hand side of this um, of, of, of this um, graphic. Um, this is especially true for, for, for Africa, for Sub-Saharan Africa. So you see that um, Sub-Saharan Africa, youth in Sub-Saharan Africa will double by 2050 and reach 600 million by uh, 2100. Um, and most of these youth will be in rural areas. Um, at the same time, and that is what you can see on the other side, um, is that the um, percentage of youth being unemployed is much higher than the percentage of the regular workforce. So it's almost uh, twice as much. Um, so what we can or what we see here is that um, these youth employment trends are a, a great or can be a great opportunity uh, for economic development, especially in the agri-food sector, because most of the jobs will, um, will be in the agri-food um, system. Um, and secondly, it can also be, a, or it is also a big challenge for, to the national employment systems. And um, because of that, um, it is a great, or like many governments have prioritized um, rural youth employment, um, and many development partners have also prioritized that topic. So that's why it's a very, very hot topic at the moment. Um, as Nadine already said, despite that relevance, um, we see that rural youth employment promotion is still a relatively new topic um, to GIZ with um, very few programs that explicitly address uh, rural youth employment promotion in a comprehensive manner. And that's the, the objective or that's the rationale also for this study. So what we wanted to do with the study is to show um, existing approaches within GIZ projects or programs um, on rural youth employment promotion. Uh, secondly, we wanted to distill some of the success factors or lessons learned um, on what works in rural youth employment promotion. And thirdly, um, we also wanted to um, see how we can adapt the integrated approach for employment promotion that GIZ developed to the rural context. Um, I think today we will mostly focus on the um, success factors, but if you want to talk about the uh, integrated approach and how that can be adapted uh, to the rural context, we can also do that in the discussion later on. Um, I think 
what is very important to say um, is that this report um, is not a comprehensive report. It should only be regarded as a first step um, because we only looked at GIZ programs. We only looked in depth at 11 GIZ programs. Um, so we didn't look at other programs from ILO, from UNDP, etc., from uh, beyond GIZ. Um, and this is definitely one of our recommendations um, that I can share already that this topic of um, what works in rural youth employment promotion should be um, analyzed in, in, in more comprehensively. Um, so what is our methodology? What did we do? So we started with a list of um, around 60 ongoing GIZ programs that all implicitly or explicitly have a focus on rural youth. Um, um, and then um, based on a couple of criteria, especially about the learnings from these programs, we reduced that to a number of 11 programs um, that we looked at in, in detail. Um, so what we did there is we uh, did a, a quantitative analysis, we conducted interviews, we did evaluations of the programs, and we came up with um, 18 success factors that are clustered along four categories. I will explain them later. Um, and, um, we, um, yeah, and we also um, developed some first ideas on how we can adapt the integrated approach for employment promotion to the rural context. So, yeah, which are these, uh, what are these 11 uh, GIZ programs? Um, it is a, a list or a, a well, a list of, of very different programs, I would say. So we have some global programs like the Green Innovation Centers, we have some continental programs, and we have some bilateral programs. Um, most of them um, are um, active in Africa, um, but as I said before, they very much differ in scope and form. So um, some come more from the rural development side, others are, come more from the uh, employment promotion side, but all of them have this explicit or implicit focus on rural youth employment promotion. So uh, just to name a few, um, some of the uh, global or continental programs like um, the Green Innovation Centers or also A4SD, um, as you probably know, I mean, they have quite large budgets. Um, they uh, go over a, a very long time frame, 10 years or so, um, and they reach um, a large number of people, in fact, millions through um, training activities, etc. Some other programs that we looked at, like um, the ATVET for women or ATVET, um, but also PAT2 in Tunisia, a bilateral program, EPP in Sierra Leone, a bilateral program, or PEJ uh, in Morocco, um, sorry, my French. Um, they have a more narrow focus on 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 um, on women, like in the case of a TVET for women, or on youth. Um, so, so we have a broad spectrum of programs that we looked at. Um, I think what you will see when you will look at the final report, and I think that's one of the. Uh, big achievements that we have here as well. We do not only have this analysis part where we come up with these 18 success factors, but we also have each of these 11 uh, programs high, like yeah, showcased in form of, a, of an in-depth case study. Um, so when you are interested specifically in the learnings of the employment promotion program in Sierra Leone, for example, you can look at that case study and you can read uh, the objectives, you can read the success factors, you can read the lessons learned from that case study. So. I think this is a very important um, factor. Um, so, what are the main learnings? Um, I think one of our key insights is that um, we would recommend all rural youth employment promotion programs to consider at least these four factors that are outlined here and that I will, um, will dive into a little bit more detail. Um, so the first one is to identify um, suitable business models for youth and to collaborate with the private sector. Um, specifically, the uh, collaboration with the private sector is very important for choosing um, the right value chains. So when you um, decide which value chains to choose, private sector involvement um, uh, should take place, as well as in the curricular development. So this is, of course, to ensure that the skills development is demand and market driven um, and that later on there exists an access to markets. So um, for example, um, a, a very interesting program that, that, that well, is pioneering this is, is, in, uh, is the E4D. So what they do, uh, just to name like a couple of examples, um, they have a, a number of private sector partnerships 
And what they do is they build um, what they call off-taker safety nets. So this means they collaborate with a number of private sector partners to guarantee a secured off-take um, of the produce. So this ensures that if one of the um, companies drops out for whatever reason, um, there are still others that can take off the produce and that the farmers will not be affected by that so much. Um, if possible, E4D chooses to collaborate with the core business department of that company. Um, they also uh, collaborate, um, if that's not possible, with the CSR department as an entry point, but they explicitly said that they would they'd prefer with the core business and because that ensures the sustainability. Um, the second um, factor um, is that um, the program should be adapted to local employment needs. Um, that is very important specifically because many programs or, or programs can do that by adapting like the context, um, uh, the content, sorry, the format and the delivery mode um, uh, to the needs of the rural youth and, and, and women. So, for example, what we saw across many projects or programs is that um, there's a focus on practical skills, on soft skills that are transferable. Um, because this prepares, especially in Africa, prepares youth um, for a future in uh, self-employment. And this is a very important, uh, like especially in Africa, that's a very important uh, topic. Um, and then, of course, we have programs like um, the ATVET for Women, um, that, that, uh, sorry, that ATVET for Women that, uh, that, that does follow-up uh, mentoring that does uh, training in villages um, and um, that uses role models. And I think this is a very interesting insight, role models and storytelling um, to empower and, and also break through the stereotypes um, that exist for women in, in Africa in the rural context. Um, thirdly, um, the increase in attractiveness of uh, agriculture among uh, rural youth. So, um, as many of you probably know, agriculture is not seen or not perceived as, as a very um, um, yeah a very attractive field to work in. So there are a couple of insights from programs, um, for example, from the Green Innovation Centers that focus on innovative ICT solutions um, and 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 downstream and upstream value chains to make it just more attractive to work in agriculture. Also, the Pro that are um, three in Togo, what they focus on is cash crops because they say that this is something. Um, well, that, that youth specifically looks for uh, income generating opportunities. They want to make a living with that. And, and that's why they focus on cash crops uh, and value added services. So, um, yeah, I think um, lastly, the last point, the last insight or the last success factor that we see as really crucial is um, that it's very important to leverage uh, local structures. Yeah, to work th with through local structures. And I think we will hear more from ATVET and also from Piaget later on that. Um, another very interesting insight came from the SEDIN uh, program in Nigeria, because um, they have partnerships with several public institutions that allowed them to integrate financial literacy or their financial literacy curricula into um, the public system. And by doing that, they reached 60,000 youth um, across the country. So leveraging the national systems is, or the national structures um, is something that we see as a key success factor. So what are other success factors? I mean, I'm not going to dive into each of them now. Um, so you can see them here. We can also discuss them later. I think what I would like to highlight is the um, or, or like the structure. So we structured them along context factors, design factors. So how do you design? How do you adapt your program um, to the needs of the of rural youth? Processes that you can uh, use and um, partners and people. So this is more who do you work with, and and, and what type of team do you need for successfully uh, managing and implementing um, these programs? I think um, what I would like to. To, to highlight is um, alignment with national systems. So that's something we will hear more later on from ATVET. Um, also the empowerment of meso level structures. So this goes a little bit into the um, adaptation that we did or the ideas for adapting the integrated approach um, for uh, youth employment. So we said that, or we see that there is a, a need for this meso level structures that help youth to get a voice, to empower youth. And um, I think the FSP uh, program in Kenya 
um, had some very nice insights on that. So you might look that up later if you are interested in the case study. The last point I wanted to highlight is the graduation approach. So um, this is called provision of support using a multi-component approach. Um, that's something that we have seen specifically pioneering in the case of EPP in Sierra Leone, where they designed a system, and Sierra Leone is a country where, of course, you have a very weak ecosystem, um, not just for youth, but in general. And the EPP program managed to design a, um, to design a structure where youth can graduate from one support activity into another support activity. So not to lose the support on the way. So this means long-term support for youth um, to actually manage to create jobs and employ other people. So this was a very interesting learning. Um, lastly, um, some of the um, key recommendations for rural youth employment promotion that we see, um, and this is the last slide, um, is that um, we definitely see a need to develop a deeper understanding um, into that topic. So as I said before, this was just the first step and um, we need to look at this more systematically also across um, other non-GIZ programs and uh, see what their learnings are. Uh, secondly, to apply and develop the integrated approach um, or the adaptation of the integrated approach for employment promotion. Um, thirdly, to take a systemic perspective. I think this is something that we also learned is quite important, specifically in a topic of rural youth employment promotion that cuts across many different sectors. So you have the Ministry of Youth involved, you have agriculture involved, you have um, well many different um, uh, departments involved. So it's something where we really need to coordinate well with others. Um, and lastly, um, during the research, we came up with a couple of unanswered questions or questions that we could not answer and where also the programs that we looked at did not really have a satisfying answer. And this is, for example, how to, come, how to overcome the issue of land rights, specifically for women um, in the agriculture context. Um, yeah, and also how to strengthen support ecosystems and uh, what basically is the best value for money in terms of activities. One of the case studies that we looked at was the Agricultural Technical Vocational Education and Training Program, um, also known as ATVET, um, and the program which specially focuses on women. Um, and this is a um, program which is closely linked to an African Union um, flagship initiative, which is the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program. Stefan, it would be great if you very briefly could tell your colleagues what the program is exactly doing to empower youth um, to work in the agricultural sector. One uh, thing we do in the ATVET and ATVET for Women modules is that we very strongly work through um, national as well as local structures. Um, we're working with the national ministries um, trying to anchor the ATVET um, or the agricultural um, component of TVET in um, national qualification frameworks. Um, we then uh, work along um, agricultural value chains um, which are different in the um, 12 countries we work in. So it's priority value chains that are selected by the national governments um, that run through the entire cut-up process the country is going through. Um, we have a competency-based training approach um, for um, uh, training of trainers as well as then for the, for the training delivery. Um, the, the private sector involvement um, is um, anchored in the, first of all, in the selection of the value chains and then the curriculum development. Um, the private sector is always an, an integral part in those things. Um, and um, during the agricultural training, um, there is um, internships and work placements as part of, of the training delivery. Um, and then um, also as indicated by, by um, Christian, we do um, include life skills, um, soft skills, um, agripreneur elements um, in the training. So it's not just technical content. Um, and we um, 
especially in the ATVIT for women, looking at um, rural women or rural youth and the realities that they live in. Um, and, um, you know, what kind of um, private engagements they have, um, some of them already working in agriculture. Um, we do a modular approach of the training delivery. So it's not a full qualification where you have to be at the institution for a certain period of time. Um, but it is a training delivery that is, um, you know, that is based on the, whatever is possible for, for the training participants. We heard from Christian that the context is really important. You already mentioned that you collaborate with the national government, um, but how does your program benefit especially from being part of that African Union flagship initiative? The CADAP initiative is, um, is an initiative by the African Union to boost um, agriculture on the continent. And um, we are the GIZ um, support program to the continental cutter program. So even, um, let me say, without GIZ, there would still be a cut-up program on the continent. And um, with these two modules, we specifically focus on um, the agricultural TVET aspect of, of the cut-up program. Um, so the, the, the cut-up is well known in, in the member states. Um, and the member states um, they ask for support in, in certain areas via the African Union Commission or the AUDA NEPAT, um, which is based here in Johannesburg, which is the African Union Development Agency, which is our implementing partner. Um, so the, the, that the initiative is well known has, has opened a lot of doors that we come as a, let me say, as a tandem between AUDA and GIZ. It is not perceived as a, a donor initiative. It is a continental program in Africa, for Africa, by Africa. And that um, makes it a lot easier, um, let's say, especially in the initial stages, to get the discussion going on how we um, then support implementation um, on, on national level. You have implementation in several countries. So as we learned from you, you have a very close um, exchange between the different countries. Um, could you share some insights from this work? In the ATVET module, we have 12 um, countries where we implement. And in the ATVET for women, we have um, six, which overlaps with um, the six from the ATVET. So 12 countries in total with, um, with uh, national staff working specifically on ATVET and ATVET for women in the countries, which are usually based um, at the um, respective departments or ministries of agriculture. Um, and um, we um, initially, um, let me say within the GIZ context, we broke down the results matrix, um, which gives us overall goals and overall targets into the 12 countries, depending on their implementation speed and where um, implementation took off, um, because not all countries um, had or have the same starting point in terms of um, a TVET implementation. Um, and we then designed um, Excel-based dashboards um, where our national coordinators put in their, based on the indicators, their data and information. And that then gets aggregated to our um, kind of the continental level that we report on. Um, and the kind of analysis that we do here from Pretoria is that we compare countries um, where something has worked well. We're trying to um, initiate peer-to-peer -peer learning between, not only between GIZ staff, but also between um, uh, ministry staff in the countries um, or lecturer staff or technical college management staff. Um, so the very strong peer-to-peer um, you know, -peer learning approach that we have with those, with those dashboards. Um, about twice a year, we try to um, we try to have a kind of face-to-face -face exchange um, as as team meetings, um, and um, we um, we have two positions in the portfolio, which are regional coordinators for for East Africa and for West Africa, where most of our countries are. 
um, and kind of also splitting them up into Anglophone and Francophone. Um, and they are pretty much the, let's say, the custodians of, of the knowledge transfer from the countries um, to the other region or to us as a, as a, a TVET office in, in Pretoria and then to the continental level um, in, in Addis or, or in Germany. Um, and we further have you know, a couple of, let me say, knowledge products that we use to, um, to share information, to give feedback to the countries. Um, we have a, um, every Friday an information email that we send to everybody. We have um, further the newest addition to the knowledge products is we have a GIZ AU newsletter where all the AU um, programs in that portfolio um, provide information to our, um, let's say, country office in Addis. Um, and then we have twice a year the, the dashboards and the, the kind of the feedback loop um, to the countries. Can you briefly tell us how you achieved this? Because it's always difficult to work with public partners and really make sure that um, the activities started by GIZ are kind of integrated and taken over by the national partner to ensure sustainability. Our uh, GRZ, ATVET and ATVET women staff in the countries, they sit um, directly at the department or ministries of agriculture and work very closely with um, the uh, departments of education or sometimes there's a, there's a ministry for TVET. Um, so always in that kind of tandem uh, agriculture and education. And um, the, um, let me say more on policy level, the first, the first activities that we do with our partners in all the countries is trying um, to include ATVET in the national qualifications framework if it hasn't been included already. Um, from there, the, the entire curriculum development process um, is, is based on national requirements. Um, so we follow um, the national um, system for curriculum development and that means that um, first of all the curriculum is, is registered and accredited and all in the respective countries. Um, the training material is then based on a, um, an accredited curriculum and um, training delivery then is um, um, you get a full um, so let me say not a certificate of participation, but you get a full qualifi uh, uh, qualification after you um, finish the training. Um, even the modules, um, certain modules along the value chain um, is accredited within the national system. So you, the, the graduates, they do get a, um, an accredited and registered um, degree, um, which um, I think also helps to to attract um, graduates into into that field, but also to makes it makes it easier for for us as GRZ to work with with our national partners, um, and we've seen already some um, some benefits or some spin-offs for that approach. Um, for example, in Burkina Faso as well as in Kenya, um, the a number of um, technical colleges that we don't directly work with they have um, now taken up the curricula and some of the, the training modules into their training calendar that has been developed with our support and are delivering that training. Um, and that is only possible, obviously, if, if the material is um, available on the, on the public domain and the Department of Agriculture or the Department of, of Education um, deliver, delivers it to, to the entire country and not only the pilot institutions that we work with. I would kind of now continue with Lisa Etzold. Lisa, uh, can you also very briefly um, tell us a bit about your program and how you are supporting um, especially the national actors to um, deliver better employment services to young people in rural Morocco? Our project is working with the Ministry of Labor and Professional Insertion and with the National Employment Agency, um, it's called ANAPEC. We will use this term more often. Um, and we're working in nine provinces in Morocco in two regions in order to improve the employment situation of young people. 
uh, in rural areas. And these young people, they are aged from, from 15 to 35. And we are supporting them directly on the one hand in uh, employment centers that we establish in the rural areas. Um, so it is the services of the employment agency, the ANAPEC, extended to the rural areas because until the beginning of the project, the employment agency was only um, operational until the regional level and not in the provinces. And these uh, employment centers are set up together with civil society organizations. So they um, offer the services of the ANAPEC directly in the rural areas and uh, all the programs are adapted to the needs of the rural pop population and the specifics of these rural areas. There we offer orientation services, we offer um, soft skills training, entrepreneurship training, and um, uh, based on the need of the province also short-term vocational trainings. At the same time, we support local employment committees. Uh, these are committees uh, led by the governor of a province and the members are members from the civil society, from the public and the private sector. And uh, they engage in a dialogue in order to conduct a labor market analysis in this province, so in their own province, in order to prioritize a sector which is promis promising to create employment. Mm -hmm. And um, afterwards, they will um, create an action plan in order to promote this one sector. And uh, while on the national level, of course, we work with the decision makers also on the region, regional level for, the level for those two to collaborate and to institutionalize the model. Thanks, Lisa. You already explained very comprehensively um, the integrated approach because I think one, your program was really one of the um, ones that works on all sides of the labor market. So you work with a policy level or on the um, framework conditions, you work on the um, supply side providing training, you work on the demand side, collaborating with the private sector, and you even have this matching component that we haven't seen in a lot of other programs, really making sure that the young people who are trained then find jobs um, or start their own business. Um, can you maybe tell us a bit like in more detail how um, you make sure that this kind of system all works together in this integrated approach. Or what is the role of GIZ in this? GIZ created this approach together with our partners. So the project created this and the approach is now being taken over by the partners. And um, of course, we take the integrated approach in order to align the supply and demand side. And this is very important in the rural areas as um, sometimes we have job positions that cannot be filled because um, skilled labor for workforce is missing. And then um, in this case, for example, we conduct labor market analysis. We talk to the actors of the um, private and public sector. And based on the needs of this province, we conduct um, short-term vocational trainings. And as I said, also we have the local employment committees that really look into, they, they go into their province, they talk to actors there in the employment on the labor, labor market, um, also in the private sector. They identify a sector which is promising to create employment in the near future. And uh, they create this action plan in order to, to really promote this sector um, to create employment and to align supply and demand side. And then on the other hand, again, we have the employment centers with the services of the ANAPEC. And of course, all of these uh, services are adapted to the rural needs. As to say, also, if we have business creation in the rural areas, then uh, the employment advisors, they know exactly which, which fields are promising um, to engage in and which fields are not. Uh -huh. Um, and you also shared with us that women especially benefited from having um, the services um, in the rural areas. Can you share um, this also with your colleagues in the webinar? For women, it's especially hard in, um, to take part in the labor market, especially in the rural areas. This is on the one hand because they 
are bound on their province, on their village they live in. They are not motorized and um, like very often. And uh, on the other hand, uh, due to traditional roles. So um, what we do is that in the employment centers, we have like, first of all, they are very close to the people. They are in the rural areas. And the employment advisors, they go out and mobilize the people in order to come to these centers. There, the employment advisors, we um, take care that we have men and women in every employment center, because very, very often women open up or are more freely, like, um, voluntarily going there if there is a woman they can talk to. Mm -hmm. um, for that, we also adjust our training hours and we offer child care if needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we offer sometimes also trainings just for women um, in order to have this boost of confidence also. One of the success factors that Christian um, shared with us earlier was also this partners and people um, aspect of um, the programs. And I think you had a very um, crucial role in creating a partnership between the local CSOs and the National Employment Center, ANAPAC. And um, how did you make this collaboration work and um, kind of also how do you make sure that it is sustainable after GIZ phases out? Because I know you're already in the second phase and I think also your role has changed quite a lot between the first and the second phase of the program. The employment centers in the rural areas, they are hosted by civil society organizations. So we work together directly with a civil society organization that is already operating in the province. The ANAPEC, they started with the decentralization um, and still in the process, and they were not present until now in the rural areas. So it was very important to have an actor there directly in the province who already knows the employment situation of the young people. Also, the civil society organization is supporting us in identifying young people that are suited to work as employment advisors in these employment centers, and they will be trained by ANAPEC. And this is very important, this proximity to the people. It's very important in order to uh, really reach the young people because they might have not might not have confidence in the employment agency, but they do in the civil society organizations. And the employment advisors they go out and animate them to come there and get um, uh, take advantage to take uh, part in these um, labor market services that we offer. Um, okay. So it was very important to have this collaboration and we uh, established it uh, in the beginning of the project. It was not very easy to create this dialogue on the national level and the local level because we follow kind of a bottom up approach. And in Morocco, this is not very common. So um, yeah, it was it was a lot of patience and uh, really we had to convince the national partners to collaborate with um, the civil society organization. But uh, by now this is integrated into the approach. It's a fixed part of the approach and it's working well. And this is very important also for the sustainability of the approach. Thank you for the uh, two case study interviews we're having. I would like to share with you the four main take-home messages that were very important for us uh, before we move into the discussion. First of all, it should be clear that uh, employment promotion is a hot topic and especially for young people uh, in rural areas because um, we see it's already being becoming a cross-cutting topic in the green innovation centers but also not only in um, the rural development department, also in the sustainable economic promotion departments. We see that um, employment promotion, of course, for the future sustainability is an important topic. And we've already also heard in the two examples here that um, it has a lot of potential for gender transformative change as well, if you think about the women and take them on in your activities as well. What we also learned by commissioning, commissioning the study is that there are already lots of good approaches within GIZ, not only in Africa, but also in Central Asia. We see there's lots 
uh, going on already and in our current mandate as a sector project of course we are gathering these good practices and try to give them back to you in the structure to see what you can learn and what you could take over for your next projects or if you're going to have a new component if you are thinking of, of including young people in your activities as well then of course um, this was was not an evaluation of projects this was um, more was a qualitative study and there we see that the approach is very quite diff or different quite widely from country to country and I mean we all are familiar with that uh, context is the most important thing um, that we should think of in our projects and so therefore sometimes they're hard to compare nonetheless we believe that you can still learn a lot from looking at these activities and think of how you can adapt them to your own contexts However, of course, and this is also always a question that comes up, um, if we want to replicate this, what does it cost? What's the value for money statement? And of course, that is because the contexts are so dif dif different all the time. Uh, this is hard to process, but this was also not the well main idea or driver behind the study to say that if you do this and that's the value for money you get if you for so many jobs and we already had the question about what happens how many jobs are actually created and we know this is a very uh, important topic too but um, what are we going to do with this now why is this important for you and how can you use this we're going to pu publish the study or release the study soon we will share it with you in our uh, community of practice and um, the sector project rural employment with focus on youth has now been shifted to being a global project however we will still keep our consulting uh, component that means we're still there for gathering best practices from all over uh, GIZ and then to mainstream them back into the system. Um, we're also going to pilot uh, new approaches within our own uh, country components, but also if you are looking for some sort of cooperation, we're always happy to talk. And um, so there's lots of go uh, going on in the sector of rural youth employment. And because I've already mentioned it, um, if you're not yet a member of our community of practice, then please become one. Uh, we are there as an exchange platform on exactly this topic of rural employment. First question was, um, Christian and Claudia, have you come across projects that are also referring to rural tourism? I know we are, we're looking at um, employment in rural areas. Tourism might not be the center point of the project, but did you come across something uh, or some project that is also promoting jobs in tourism? In this research, the program that we looked at, there was no kind of specific tourism program. Um, but we know, for example, that um, in Malawi, um, where we will be next week to support the team of the Green Innovation Center and the Violet Heart program to um, create new activities in rural youth employment, they, that's a bilateral program and they also work in tourism. Um, so they also don't have a specific youth component yet, but um, obviously it's the youth is an important um, part of their target group. Um, but I might hand over to Christian because he was just in Indonesia um, working on local tourism and um, the employment possibilities, but not for GIZ, but for UNDP. So Great potential or great opportunity um, to, um, to, to work with uh, rural youth in, in the tourism sector. We published a guide on how you can develop inclusive business models in the tourism sector. Um, but overall, I mean, it is also, it, or it can also be linked to agriculture, right? So I think there's a lot, and this is also what M Mira uh, in Malawi um, tried or was was doing is to um, develop some opportunities there for um, for um, local communities to collaborate and by uh, contributing like by um, producing um, vegetables etc for um, for for lodges or for uh, rural lodges etc so there are a lot of overlaps also between agriculture and tourism that's I think what I the point I want to make we have um, had a question and a comment on okay we seem to focus very strongly on skills development but what about other factors that influence 
the promotion of jobs, um, and I mean that's also part of the inter integrated approach, right? So we have the supply side and the demand side and the matching and all the legal frameworks around it. So um, what are your experiences on um, the other factors like access to finance? Capacity building is just a very strong um, element of GISET's work. So um, a lot of the program had capacity building um, components or modules but as you also said that a lot of them had were also working on the on the framework conditions not so many were working on the the matching um, and indeed finance is probably the the one element that is um, is not so um, present in many programs, but we also found, for example, in the Sierra Leone case, they have an, um, what they call facility of innovation. And this is an, a program to support youth on the one hand with advice to start their own business, but then also provide them um, with a grant to really start the business. And I think it's up to $8,000. Um, so there is also um, or the programs that work on entrepreneurship, especially, they also provide finance um, for the successful graduates of the program. There will be more information, of course, in the study, but we are aware that, of course, topics like access to finance, access to land, generational exchange are big, big influential factors when it comes to youth employment, especially in the rural areas. And yeah, one another uh, very interesting uh, question from Sierra Leone was what comes after the training? What comes after the um, capacity development? How can um, we actually measure how many of these young people get a job? We also had very interesting discussions how to actually measure um, the job creation in the rural um, areas. Um, so this is probably one separate discussion, how the technicalities of the, the monitoring and the evaluation. Um, but what we see in general, I mean, how you kind of graduate from the training to then finding a job. Um, there we, we saw that it's on the one hand really important to have these matching activities um, and not just stop at the end of the training and then leave everybody on their own. Um, so what the example from Morocco really um, does a very good job in using the integrated approach um, from analyzing the needs of the companies, then providing the specific training and then also making sure that the, um, that the youth really find jobs in these companies. Um, but on the other hand, there's also this graduation approach that is exactly done in Sierra Leone where you train youth as an entrepreneur but then also provide them with money to start their own business and then also support them long term with coaching so I think it's important not to to do um, one activity which is pretty isolated but really take the um, this integrated approach and um, make sure you um, kind of you support the, your beneficiaries um, along the way. Um, and yeah, so it's just um, probably a learning which is true for all programs, but especially in the rural area where the ecosystem for entrepreneurs or young people is not very good, it's especially important to um, kind of provide the support to make sure people are not left alone. Sorry, if I can maybe um, give an example on the topic of um, measuring employment um, situation of graduates. Um, we're currently um, doing a multi-country um, tracer study of our ATVET and ATVET women graduates. Um, it's unfortunately it's in its final stages, but um, unfortunately not the data analysis not as far as I can that I can give you information on on the numbers for our programs, which will probably be um, early next year. Um, 
where we um, also applied the, the GIZ definition for um, employment in rural areas. So we are um, looking at uh, new employment or an increased income um, or reduction in underemployment, which is the um, uh, which is kind of the focus of, of, of our project. Um, and um, we'll, we'll, we're working on a, on a obviously a report on um, what effects the, the program had, but we're also working on um, for our partner institution a bit of a guideline document on how to implement and conduct tracer studies in um, specifically in, in ATVET. Um, and once that's final, um, I can obviously also share it with um, on the on the EDA platform. And the sector project came up with or had a uh, methodology developed to de together with the RWI Institute on uh, measuring rural employment because we all know employment in agriculture uh, may result in a couple of more working hours but when is it con uh, can you consider it a new job being created and things like that so you can also already find this on the EDA community but uh, if you have any more questions uh, we're going to of course uh, send it to you and we're going to develop in the next year um, a more comprehensive tool on how to apply this methodology because currently it's a quite long study um, but yeah we, we can definitely and we will share this with you.